Good morning. We're about to start uh, the workshop, so please uh, be seated. Okay, I'll ask you to put uh, the PowerPoint up. Thank you. <coughs> Welcome to this uh, workshop this morning uh, with the title, What Operator Models for Digital Inclusion? My name is uh, Bengt Mullerid. I'm with the Swedish regulator, PTS, as well as I'm chair for uh, a working party on infrastructure and communication service policies at the OECD. And what we will do here this morning, we will uh, raise a couple of important questions, how to bridge basically the, the digital divide and how can we facilitate a digital inclusion. With me here today is uh, on my left side, we have Chene Cher. Welcome, Chenere. She is with the Web Foundation as a research manager, right? And then uh, we have Verena Weber, head of uh, the unit on, what do we say, CISP? Infrastructure. The infrastructure, Communication Infrastructure and Service Policy Unit at uh, the OECD. And then uh, we have Christoph Steck with us, welcome. Uh, is director of public policy and internet at Telefonica. So what will happen here, first I will make a short introduction and then uh, the three panelists will make each uh, presentation and then it's addressed basically around two questions and then we follow up with two other questions in part two and then follow up by a Q&A session. So I welcome you to prepare your questions and uh, intervention. So, very much welcome. Internet usage keeps growing, but we all know that not everyone is connected, not everyone that wants to be connected are connected. I'm aware, I don't know exactly where we are today, but something around uh, 4 billion people around the globe are, are having internet connectivity. And I think uh, mobile users are somewhere around 7 billion users in the world. So still, there are a lot of people in the world that is not able to, to connect, that would like to connect. And certainly it varies uh, to what extent people are connected in urban versus rural areas. And certainly it depends on the geographical uh, have, have the dispersion of, of population, like in the Netherlands, all one, everyone is connected with at least 30 megabit. It's a country where roughly 100% of the households have cable. While uh, in, in my country, Sweden and Finland, on the very right side here, we have a lower share of uh, people in the rural areas that are able to connect with, with 30 megabit. And this is just the OECD countries. And uh, here with today, we'll also talk about a large number of other countries that these numbers are, are, are lower. The idea with the workshop is really to link uh, the digital inclusion to the development of technology as well as the business, business models uh, that uh, companies are, are pursuing around the world. 
And certainly with the convergence of IP networks, things have changed compared to, to old times with more dedicated networks. And also through the, the IPification of networks where services could be separated from the, from the actual transmission. And certainly there are a number of emerging technologies that also could alter the picture with blockchain, for example, artificial intelligence, which certainly to some extent are, are part of these networks. And if you look at the business models that are applied for operators around the world, most commonly uh, it's still, I would say, vertically integrated operators where they are investing in the networks and uh, producing the services and then selling to, to the retail customers. I mean, telecom, and then we have the cable, which depends a little bit on the different geographical areas. But there's also a trend of, that we will hear a little bit more about the wholesale. Wholesale operators, uh, both public, private, and a dedicated operator, that is, I would say, increasing in, in significance around the world. Clearly opening up the networks for, for service providers. And then new kinds of players that are interested in this and entering the field. We call them terminal or equipment, or we can say online service companies or service providers that are also entering or active in, in, in within the operator space. Two recent works uh, by, by the, uh, produced by the OECD. One uh, report, the left one, is uh, addressing the operators and the future, examining the different operators and the different uh, business models in development around the world. This, uh, the report are available, uh, free download, at the OECD Digital Library. And this gives, the report gives a large number of examples uh, both, we can say, municipal networks uh, in a number of countries uh, and also privately investment of wholesale operators and also the, uh, how the vertically integrated operators are developing around the world as well as technology development. And the other uh, report is bridging the rural digital divide, I mean, which is the big question, I would say, for, for all governments. How to reach the unconnected? And I would say the underpinning is that in order to build the networks, you need capital. That will never go away. The capital intensity of infrastructure is there, uh, but it's just a question how we can solve it. And this report address uh, and give a large number of examples around the world uh, of how to bridge the digital divide. And I think this work has to continue because, as I said initially, there is a large number of people unconnected that would like to be connected and also for societies. The objective and the aim with this workshop is to discuss concrete and innovative ways to connect people and businesses for expanding the digital inclusion. We will hear about examples uh, that Telefonica is, is involved in. It's just one example and there are probably more examples and I also would like to ask you as, as a listener to also be active and see if you have other proposals. I understand the community networks, examples that they are also interesting to, to, to hear more about. So what we'll do in the first part after now I've been setting the scene is to see the different operator models and digital inclusion where they, each of the panelists will give and make an in intervention. And then the second part is uh, they will do an explore and examine the challenges and possible solutions to these challenges and to the, in order to bridge this digital divide. And then uh, fourthly, in q and I invite you to, to raise questions and question what you have heard or add new, new aspects that could be relevant for, for the discussion and then we will wrap up. So the first part is, is addressing two questions. What new business models and technology solutions can assist to narrow the digital broadband divide? And what operator models have proven to work well to expand connectivity? So with that, I invite, um, we will do in, in um, 
Verena, but before, and then the second uh, part, we will then raise the questions, what are the main existing challenges to expand the quality of affordable broadband, and what tools could be developed to ensure the internet access it was sustainable and inclusive. So with that, uh, I would like first uh, to invite uh, Rina Weber to make a presentation or intervention to her view about the first two questions. Thank you, Bengt, and uh, good morning, everyone. So as Bengt mentioned, um, we did this report on the operators and their future, and we looked at um, the different business models. So we looked at vertically integrated operators, so this is typically operators um, offering fixed uh, and mobile um, broadband services. Then we looked at um, cable operators. We looked at um, wholesale operators and internet companies. And now to the question, okay, what kind of business model work um, to connect rural and remote areas? Um, so what we can see is that, um, first of all, in all of the different um, areas, we see um, all these types of operators, right? We have a couple of OECD countries uh, where we have cable operators that serve especially rural areas. Uh, we have the traditional telcos that serve a lot of rural areas. Um, uh, we have internet companies that have quite innovative models um, to serve those areas. Um, well, the Google Loon project is one. Um, some are experimenting with drones. Um, and we, we have the wholesalers. So. Um, out of these models, though, um, what we see is that the wholesale model is growing. So what we see is that um, a couple of communities uh, basically um, are building up um, uh, infrastructure um, that rely on open access. So basically, uh, we see a lot of those infrastructures in, in Sweden, where Bank is from, where basically um, the municipalities build up a fiber network, um, and then it's open access and then people can compete on the retail level. And I think we're, we're hearing another example of a wholesale access model uh, from, from Telefonica um, in just a couple of minutes. Um, so this is something we see um, that is um, on the rise, both in urban but also in rural areas. And actually, um, that allows you know, to have like one infrastructure that you create, um, especially for areas where otherwise it's not viable. Um, to have like um, parallel infrastructures, but then we see that you get competition, which is something which is very important for the OECD on the retail level. So you open the infrastructure um, for people to compete um, basically on the retail level. Mm. Then what we also see is that we have uh, some type of different business models that seem to work rather well in rural areas. So one example um, is from Germany. There is one operator um, that is deploying fiber um, only in very rural and remote areas, um, in villages that often do not even have a cable connection, which is, you know, something which is not, I mean, most, most of Germany has some sort of cable. And um, the way they do this is by demand aggregation. So basically they go to the village and say, um, well, we need a commitment from the village um, to get at least 40% um, of the households connected and buying our services. So and once they have this demand aggregated, um, they start rolling out the infrastructure. Um, what is interesting is that this is, um, in most cases, also open access based. So they roll it out, but they let other providers on, the, on their network, on their fiber network. And what they also do, and this is especially important when it comes you know, to rolling out a mobile infrastructure like 4G, 5G, um, mainly 4G at the moment, is they are connecting um, the towers um, of the different operators um, uh, with their fiber. Um, so what I then uh, want to say, because I mean, I'm, I'm from the OECD, so we are always looking at policies, okay, so what kind of policies work um, for extending connectivity in rural and remote areas? There are a couple, so I just mentioned three. So what we see is that um, whenever there is a positive business case, we think it should be the private sector rolling out these networks. We see, though, that in, in uh, quite a number of OECD countries, there is agreement um, that in very rural and remote areas, the public, uh, the private sector cannot do it on its own. So we see a model where basically um, the government is providing subsidies, uh, where it's um, often a public private partnership or whether it's subsidies and then the operators are rolling out the networks. So basically we see that in, in some areas um, there is some need for public intervention. 
Um, the second issue, which is actually an, an important issue, is to streamline rights of ways. So especially like uh, in, in a lot of rural and remote areas, it's quite burdensome um, for the operators to roll out their infrastructure. There's a lot of red tape. Uh, you have different government levels. And it's quite hard um, you know, to, to get these right of ways. So what we recommend there is to really streamline the rights of way, make it easier for operators to roll, it, roll out their infrastructure because um, that also makes it um, cheaper for them. And, and then our third um, area that I want to highlight is um, the use of public space um, to, to put, for instance, uh, antennas for mobile communication networks there. So what we see is like a couple of countries um, have tried to indicate where they have um, their, basically their public space, uh, where providers can put the infrastructure and we recommend. So one, it should be transparent, uh, which public spaces can be used and second, it should not be about the money, but rather about um, how um, can we get um, rural and remote areas connected. And I think I leave it here for the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Verena. And with that, uh, let me uh, give the floor to Christoph and uh, her about the more telephonic as uh, interesting example. Please, Christopher. Yes, thank you. Um, you're putting up the slides, I suppose. I have a couple of slides just to illustrate a little bit the case. I mean, um, I think as, um, as Bengt and Verena have said, um, I will pro provide you with a specific case um, of what we call Internet para todos, uh, Internet for all in Spanish in, in Peru. Um, we are the, the leading operator in, in Peru um, in providing fixed and, and mobile services. Um, and basically, that's a project we started officially at the beginning of this year. Uh, we've worked on it for quite a long time, nearly two years, um, because the setup was not, not, not easy. Um, it is um, based on, um, I think the slides have been up there and then it disappeared. Yeah, okay. Ah, uh, they're working on it. Ah, here we go. Here we go. So, um, it is... It is a, a specific uh, uh, setup um, where we kind of, I think, innovate in, in, in various aspects. Um, first of all, it is um, a kind of joint uh, investment um, together with Facebook um, and two regional development banks, uh, BIT and CAF. I mean, they are like uh, uh, public development banks and they, they provide funding. Um, uh, Facebook as well, um, and, and we as well. So we basically kind of teamed up uh, between the four and have created a specific company just for the rural area. So um, that's not Telefonica, um, that's an operator called IPT, uh, Internet para todos. Um, and basically this operator is providing uh, open uh, wholesale access specifically in, uh, in remote and rural areas where there's no connectivity or there is basically uh, just a very basic connectivity. I will show you in a second what that means. Um, uh, it's quite um, interesting because we have really uh, put us quite ambitious targets. For example, one you see here, we want to lower uh, the capex, that means the capital investment uh, we do by 50% um, in comparison to uh, what normal uh, capex investments are from our side. Um, and I will show you that this is based on using technology in a different way. Um, we are also open to basically include everyone. Uh, we've just announced uh, these days um, the first agreement with Loon, that's the initiative by Google, um, where they have you know, balloons flying 25 kilometers above, the, the, the above Earth, and they're basically giving connectivity broadband going to using these balloons. Um, and we are cooperating for them for a long time, uh, right from the first experiments, um, and, and we basically feel now it's time to, to open it up. So we are going to work with them for very remote areas in Peru where we have the Amazonas um, basically in Peru, which is a very sparsely populated areas, and we will build there for 200,000 people connectivity using the, the balloons by, uh, provided by, by Google. Um, and they basically, I mean, that's not Telefonica, that's again uh, IPT. Um, so we are basically teaming up with them. So it's an interesting project uh, if you think that we have Facebook on board, we have Google on board, uh, operator. So I mean, just the setup is quite unusual, I can tell you. Um, 
And, and so basically, um, we are open to, to sign up uh, others as well. So we are, it's, it's, a, it's a really a model where we feel in, the, in essence that if you have very remote areas where usually also the, um, the buying power is, is lower, uh, you have kind of a, a double sandwich of a problem. You know, you have higher costs in rolling out the infrastructure because they are very remote areas. Sometimes you have, don't have electricity and these kind of things. Um, so it's more complex to build networks. And then at the same time, you have less people, and these people are able to spend less than people in cities. So, I mean, that's from an economic point of view, commercial point of view, is like the worst case scenario. This is why in these areas there's no connectivity. It's not that operators don't want to build it, it's just that there's no commercial uh, viable case up to now. So we said, okay, let's kind of change that and let's try to see how we can bring down TOS and how can we bring up the demand. And the demand is, to, be, to put it very simple, and I'm sitting next to Verena, so I don't hope she will get uh, she will get any <laughs> any kind of heart attack. But I mean, of course, it's a it's a it's a monopoly you build. I mean, you have to build a monopoly to basically bundle all the demand in one infrastructure. As we don't like monopolies and no one likes them, um, we have to do it in the way Verena described before um, that we basically open it up in, on a wholesale basis. So we create at least you know the competition regarding the commercial services um, on the service level. Um, but we have the same infrastructure and all demand, all collective demand in these areas go to one network. Otherwise, from our point of view, there's no viable uh, commercial case. I mean, then you have to work with subsidies, and we feel that subsidies are, um, especially in countries like America, um, not very sustainable. I mean, you never know when, you know, the next budget comes up and suddenly the subsidies are not there anymore, and then the infrastructure is not uh, there for long term. Our investments are done for a generation, for 25, 30 years, so, I mean, uh, you can imagine that this is very complex to work then with subsidies, uh, subsidies models. So I'm not sure, I'm not saying that it's totally impossible to use subsidies, but it's, it's a challenge in itself. Yeah? So basically, that's, that's what, um, what we do. Um, I just wanted to show you a little bit the, I mean, what's really happening on the ground. Um, we basically have currently uh, 6 million people in Peru um, without uh, internet access um, or mobile broadband. Um, uh, we have... Um, uh, kind of a, a double strategy. First of all, and this is the area you see the, the blue spots uh, on this map and also the blue bubble. Um, we have around half of these six million people where you have um, um, connectivity, but um, this is kind of sometimes a 2G network only and you don't have uh, um, you don't have the, the broadband connectivity. So basically what we're doing here is uh, building overlay. Um, that means we are upgrading these sites to, to 4G, um, basically providing then um, an overlay network to give connectivity. Uh, the problem with uh, the existing, sometimes there's an existing, you know, very, uh, very unreliable connectivity or something like that is that we feel that this is becoming obsolete. I mean, these networks will be not, not maintained. So basically, we are basically uh, get going to a problem where these networks will disappear over the next two years. So we are trying to build a kind of longer term overlay on that. So this is like upgrading from 2G to uh, 4G um, where there is already connectivity existing. And then we have what we call a greenfield. Greenfield is where there's no connectivity whatsoever. Um, they, you have different challenges there. I mean, you don't have, for example, masts and towers. Um, you have um, no energy sometimes um, provided, so we work with solar energy um, to give energy in these areas. Um, you don't have the transport network. That means that's the, the backbone, you know, where basically you, you bring from the access network from the antenna, then the, the connectivity to the core uh, internet. Um, so all of that needs to be built there. So this is quite a challenge. I mean, that's what people sometimes think about when we sp speak about uh, rural connectivity. It's the green field. Having said that, as you see, half of the um, half of the the people who are uh, unconnected in Peru live in areas where we have to build overlay. That means there is some form of uh, basic connectivity, um, but not on the level that you can really uh, have a, a good um, internet usage. So this is a, these are different challenges, I would say. Um, just to give you uh, a kind of idea what we achieved in five months only since the launch. As I said, we're working on that for over two years, but we launched it officially five months ago. Um, we have um, connected um, half a million um, 4G clients already. Um, we have built around 500 4G sites. Um, 
um, there is an um, uh, interesting effect that we have seen that um, there is a higher ARPU. ARPU means average revenue per user. So, I mean, there's a higher, there's more people spend in the end in these areas than what we would have expected initially. And there's a growth. Uh, so that's very, very important because it shows that there is uh, potential for growth in these areas as well. Um, and, and we are basically working to, towards the, the target of getting 4 million connected in the next two years. Um, there are a couple of uh, regulatory issues uh, involved in that as well, but maybe we can keep it then for the second part to talk about the regulatory stuff. I have a little video here. Um, I think it's in Spanish, but there you can put subtitles uh, in YouTube um, and it comes up in, in English. I'm not sure if you want to put it up. It's just two minutes, but it uh, gives you an idea what happens when connectivity comes to these areas. Yeah, uh, you have to click on, it's, if you click on the picture, um, it should start. If it's not working, don't worry. Huh? I mean, it's just you can you can find it on YouTube. If you put Internet para todos, you will there will be videos coming up. You can you can have a look at that. So, I mean, just to finalize, I mean, that's the project. We are quite excited about it. Um, we are, um, we feel that this is an alternative model to what we've seen before as uh, more publicly funded uh, open wholesale networks. Um, we see that there is um, interesting demand as well in how we use technology. And that's maybe something I should describe to you. Um, I said that we innovated in various, various parts. Uh, one of the interesting things is that um, by teaming up with Facebook, for example, uh, we found out that there are better ways to plan networks. I say that very bluntly, yes. And it's, it's, uh, it's nearly a little bit of shame, but I mean, to be honest, I mean, of course, we are, we are operators, so we have uh, a good uh, idea what happens on our network. But when there's no network, we put up, you know, the finger up there. And I mean, it's really difficult to find the islands, as we call them, of demand. Um, uh, I think that uh, we've seen, uh, before some examples how you can do that and how you can try, try to find out if there is demand in some areas. But actually you can use technology. Um, so what we developed with Facebook was using uh, anonymized, I mean the data is, is not, we cannot see who that is, I mean, but we use basically crowd data um, to find out um, what people um, are doing if there is, for example, just the, the, the information, if there is enough smartphones in an area shows that there is potential demand for broadband. Um, so if we see that there are a lot of people using smartphones but having no connectivity, we know that there is a demand. Um, we can uh, sometimes even see, you know, um, you know what are applications uh, used and you can, you know, if there's a lot of videos and so on involved, you know that there's going to be demand. So we can basically use uh, big data and artificial intelligence to find these islands of, um, of unserved demand. And that means that we can plan much easier that if you put their connectivity, you know, we're going to get quite a good response. Um, so just a little example what you can do. Then we are all working with uh, a lot in a project, again, with Facebook and many other operators called um, it's a telecom infra project. Um, and that's really interesting. Um, it's basically a, a really kind of um, R&D uh, work uh, to look into um, open RAN solutions. Um, so there are quite fascinating ideas around open RAN, uh, R-A-N, uh, open radio access network. So um, the idea is that you don't use proprietary solutions, that you go basically to um, more open source solutions for radio access as well. Um, that brings down cost a lot. Um, uh, and these kind of things. So we're trying to innovate um, in, in various areas. First, in the way um, how we co brought together these um, the people working on that project. I mean, it's a quite unusual coalition, I would say. Um, then basically in the way how we deploy the technology, um, super specifically focused on being experts in bringing connectivity in rural areas. 
Um, that's not what we might do in, in cities, but we can do it in these um, areas. That doesn't mean it's bad quality. It just means you have to operate totally differently and, and have uh, other, other kind of priorities. And, um, and the third part is innovation on the regulatory side that is more with the Peruvian regulator and I can speak about that a little bit later uh, because that's one of the, um, the barriers as well. I mean that we need the right regulation to be able to do these things. So, um, so I, will, I, I will stop here. I mean, if you want to put the video, it's just two minutes to give you an idea. La llegada de internet acá en Europa fue una cosa maravillosa, ¿no? Tanto la comunidad y como la parte educativa nos está dando muchos, muchos beneficios. Hay un cambio total de, en, en nuestra comunidad en ese caso. El acceso a internet es una herramienta imprescindible para los profesores, una ventana abierta al mundo para los alumnos. Internet para Todos es un proyecto de Telefónica que está transformando la educación en más de 3.000 poblaciones remotas del Perú. Descúbrelo en Telefónica Online. Well, that was not the video, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. That was one of the videos. There's a longer one, but uh, keep it, keep it, uh, keep it there. We can, we, you can have a look at yourself. Yeah. In YouTube, there are various videos about the project. Yeah? Thank, Thank you, you very much, Christopher. And I think uh, <laughs> I recommend you to, to uh, look at the YouTube afterwards. And, and uh, with that, thank you, and we will come back to this example in, in the next phase of questions. But before that, I would like to hand over the floor to Chine Sher. Please, you have the floor. Um, thank you very much, and it's always interesting to hear from previous speakers how they've been rolling out and addressing these issues. And as, so my name is Chine Che, and I am a Gender and Digital Rights Research Manager from the Web Foundation, and I actually um, sorry, I actually look at operator models from the user perspective. What does it mean to actually be connected? And I think for all of my research, um, the one thing that I think is lacking from operator models is actually thinking about the meaningful connectivity aspect to it. And I think it's about not, so from, so we're speaking about OECD countries and the rollout that's been happening, but from an African perspective, and I will, because this is the sector that I know and I'll comment from this perspective, at the end of the day, it's the bottom line. So meaningful connectivity is being done to ensure that operators are able to address revenue loss as people have been moving towards the data segment. So there's more investment in that aspect. I think a couple of years ago, South Africa had the biggest case where, um, with the rise around um, net neutrality and zero rating, OTT operators were seen as a threat and the modeling aspect to that was that they should be addressed as full-on operators. However, they were providing a cheaper alternative to be able to communicate whereas operators were introducing models that ensure that they can protect their traditional voice and SMS markets. So in that instance, when you place it in that context of what actually is this, when we talk about operator models for inclusion, are they focusing around meaningful inclusion that allows for people to have freedom, power, and flexibility to decide how they can be connected and how they may well enjoy the internet? So for me, that is my starting point and how inclusive it is. So um, in reflection to some of the models as the previous speaker was talking about how they've worked with um, Facebook and a, a big bank, I'm assuming it's a big bank, I, I could be wrong, but then th that idea alone already highlights to these operator models are not actually inclusive of the people they are trying to include into the system. So then if you think about the alternatives that have been produced such as community networks, so I'm happy that we've got people from community networks that actually do work and they can add on to what I'm about to say, but I do think that in thinking about um, operator, operator models for inclusion, there is a need to actually assess at the end of the day who actually is included in the design of the process and who actually has a say on what has to be rolled out. So currently in South Africa, there is this hype to get everyone involved in building networks for um, the fourth industrial revolution to have 5G ready networks. But when you actually assess the quality of the networks in urban areas, you do find that in um, lower income urban areas, they actually have poor connectivity. So while the operator has reached the threshold to ensure that like, they've covered a capital city and everyone has their towers everywhere, when you actually go on the ground and do the research with these people that you're trying to ensure that they're included, they are still having to have multiple SIM cards to ensure that one, they have a good quality network at a certain time of the day, two, they can actually afford it. So I think in developing these um, operator models that are inclusive, the question is around are they 
basically going to be a monopoly that allows for them to make more revenue? Are there going to be a monopoly that allows for people to actually be on the networks at an affordable price and at good quality and allows them to have power over the kind of services that they can have? Um, and I think also the question around, a point was raised around um, business cases to actually then go into underserviced areas and does it make sense for a bigger operator? Absolutely, if you're not going to make as much money as you think is necessary, then I can understand that the case you won't be in there. But then now there's a need to actually collaborate beyond the big operators who then if we come together we would be able to tap into this market and support alternative means of access. So then that's when you find in some cases um, community networks have been rolled out because of the bottom-up approach and that allows for people to have ownership of access and resources and to actually understand what it is that's going on. So I think one of um, an anecdotal example of how um, as fiber networks were being rolled out, there were still people were actually either cutting onto the fiber networks or the right of way issues or people digging up the fiber thinking that there was copper in there. But then that's a question of have we actually may people have ownership of these networks that were rolling out to ensure that they can have good access. So I think that um, idea of business models that then allow for, for operators themselves to say this is a business case that allows us to evolve can happen where it's been succeeding, but there's a need to open up more to actually allow alternative players and to support alternative players and not to see them as competition. So I'll give you an example of um, one of the issues around with the OTT models that were coming up, and it's a pitch that Facebook is not on the table today. Um, but then operators had the choice of either that they would evolve and you know launch um, OTT models, or they would partner with these OTT models, and that was the only way then that they could ensure that they would maintain market revenue. But when you actually looked at the quality of services around OTT um, services that as a way to ensure that people stay on the network, they were actually quite problematic. So I think in thinking about operator models for inclusion, we have to really ask ourselves inclusion for who and who is at the table and who's participating and who has ownership. And is it meaningful connectivity that allows for meaningful usage of this network? Because at the end of the day, one of the challenges is that you will roll out this network, but there's no uptake to it. So that for me has, as I've been sitting and listening to this panel, a need to actually assess the demand side issues and to include them in these models for um, operator networks that allow for inclusion. Else at the end of the day, we just have to be truthful that revenue is at the bottom line. If we're trying to make money at the end of the day, this is what we want to focus on. If we, rather than saying, um, let's try to be inclusive but not actually deal with the issues around inclusivity. So I think I ended up critiquing <laughs> the comments rather than proposing a, mo a model for inclusion, but I think those are the questions that need to be taken into account when we're saying we are working towards creating operator models that allow for inclusion. Thank you, Chane. Um, there's certainly there are a number of perspectives uh, on the inclusion, who has the right, who has the control, who is uh, having the access, who owns the network, so where's the money coming from, etc., etc. So yes, there's some good, uh, Good question there that we will uh, add here in the discussion. But before that, it's uh, also a possibility now in the part two to say, okay, what is the main existing challenges to expand the quality and affordable broadband services? Uh, as you, Shanae, already raised some of these issues, but I think we'll, we, we'll let the panelists um, address two questions here. What's the main existing challenges to expand the quality and affordable broadband services? And secondly, what tools could be developed to ensure that internet access is both sustainable and inclusive for all, for all groups of people? So uh, I will hand over to, to Rena to, to give your view on these two questions, main existing challenges and, and what tools uh, could be developed for access, so that, uh, in order for access both be sustainable and inclusive. Please, Verena. So I think we, we started talking about some challenges. Um, I think uh, Christopher and I both raised um, the fact that um, often for the private sector, um, if you do it like the normal way, um, there, there is just no positive business case. Um, so we need to find solutions to work on this. Um, I mentioned like the solutions, one is, is the wholesale model. Um, the second one is having um, increased um, use, of, use of infrastructure sharing so that you know operators share um, the infrastructure among themselves 
Um, so there, there are different levels. So uh, we quite like um, passive infrastructure sharing. Um, then when it comes to active infrastructure sharing, I mean, uh, we all, all always need sure, you know, that we maintain um, the competition um, in those areas. Um, then um, the second one is around um, how can we remove um, barriers like policy and regulatory barriers. Uh, I think that's an important one. Um, I mentioned um, the streamlining rights of way. Um, then we need to make sure um, there is um, enough spectrum available for these areas, etc. Uh, it's easy to dig up the ground, things like this. And, and then like a, a third big challenge is the uptake by the population. So basically, um, people uh, need to be able um, to afford a broadband connection, but uh, people also uh, need to know why it's good for them um, to use the internet. And I, I see we have some um, Colombian colleagues in the room, so uh, I used to work for a year for a Colombian minister. And there the situation was that basically, you know, in Colombia you have a lot of micro companies. So it's a one person running a mom and pop shop. Uh, basically, or person like selling, uh, you know, construction supplies, etc. And none of these shops were connected. And so uh, the ministry went out and was like, okay, guys, why are you not connected? And we thought the number one reply would be, well, because we cannot afford it. Uh, the number one reply was, because we don't think it's useful for us. Uh, so basically, what that ministry then did is they worked together with the bigger companies. Uh, to come up with applications for the whole supply chain because, I mean, they're either buyer or sellers of these bigger companies um, to develop, you know, some digital applications that were useful for the whole supply chain. Um, because the bigger companies said, look, I mean, we have no transparency what these people are um, buying or selling. For us, it would be useful to know that. And basically, um, that allowed to uh, increase the revenues of those very small companies by about 20%. So people were like, okay, um, if I'm connecting, um, I see why, why this is useful for me, for my business, for my family. And actually, this is how um, the uptake was achieved. So I think demand side issues um, are important, basically raising awareness, you know, what can you do with it? How can it be useful? Uh, you know, aside from, you know, we know that entertainment is a big part, but it's by far not the most useful part. So how can people make use of the internet? And I think Chennai mentioned also the like the ownership so that, you know, um, this is an infrastructure everyone should care about um, is very important. So I would think um, these are, uh, for, for us at least, um, um, the main challenges. Thank you, Rina. And uh, I'll then hand over to, to um, Christoph Steck in order to say, okay, based yeah. upon what you have told us, you know, what are the main existing challenges to expand these quality networks uh, and make it also affordable. And I assume also what uh, Sinead asked here, you know, okay, you're building this network, but still there is some commercial interest here. There's some hidden agenda or something, or so if you can give some color on that, it will be helpful. And then, okay, what are the yeah. tools here? Uh, of, Please, course, of course, it's a huge hidden agenda here, not so hidden maybe. Uh, of course, we want to make money there. I mean, uh, and I think that's a good driver. It's not that this is uh, awful. On the contrary, I mean, that's why we have now half of the world population connected because operators try to make money with internet access. Otherwise, we, we wouldn't be there. So I think that uh, this, this uh, intention is not bad. Um, the question is, of course, that you want to make reasonable return. You don't want to make you know, excessive returns on, on, on what you do, and, and that's not the idea. The idea is really that there is um, a bottom of the pyramid in, in Latin America, and of course, the same happens in many other parts of the world. Um, which uh, is unserved. And the current um, model of operations of operators is not, honestly, not able to provide connectivity there because we are just not, um, I mean, our, our networks have been built always with the idea um, of, you know, you buy equipment from a, a big uh, producer, you know, and you know the names and then you deploy it and, you know, every antenna costs 150,000 euros and then you look at, well, I mean, if I can just get a return of two, you know, euros a month, um, I mean, that will cost, uh, that will take me so many years. No, I don't do it. I'd rather go to the areas where I can get that back in half the time and that's it. I mean, that's why there is no connectivity in some areas. That's why you have white spots and that's, that's a problem. So I think that's what we're trying to address here. And I thought that we, we try to think out of the box here. Um, 
it's not easy for an operator to suddenly say, and Telefonica gave away what we had at, in rural connectivity, the network and everything to this new company. I mean, uh, you can imagine that from a cultural point of view, that's not easy to kind of give it away to a company where we have a share, of course, but it's not fully owned by Telefonica. And we are basically uh, working together with others. Uh, we are opening up to everyone and so on and so forth. So, I mean, there are a lot of uh, changes and paradigms we did here. Uh, as I told you, what the barriers are. Um, I think, and that's the question number one coming, I suppose it would come here as well, why Peru? Why do, why do we do it in Peru and not somewhere else? Um, and the answer to that is because they had the right regulatory environment. I mean, as simple as it is. Um, they had the right uh, environment because they already years ago installed uh, a kind of possibility in their telecom regulation that there can be something like a rural operator. And this rural operator is different from a let's call it, uh, I don't want to call it city operator because that's something else, but I mean operator operating in, in populated areas, um, the ones you know. Um, and, and, and that basically helped us a lot. So what are issues um, they, they provided us? Um, one is, for example, um, regarding um, uh, spectrum costs. I mean, if you have the shared goal that you want to provide connectivity to everyone, I think this needs to be some shared initiative by the public and the private. I explained to you what the private can do and what you know we and others are doing, but it's also something you know then the regulator and the government has to step in. Um, and I think one thing they have to consider is why do I ask for the same price of spectrum in very populated areas and in more rural areas? I mean, if the business model is so different, if the underlying uh, macroeconomic factors are so different. Um, is there not maybe a possibility to provide spectrum on a cheaper basis in for rural areas? That would be a kind of subsidy, or it would be a subsidy which is not costing uh, a kind of a, a direct payment by the government, and it would be more sustainable long term, for example, because you cannot easily turn that back afterwards. Uh, so one of the, the challenges I just gave to you is that if governments have to pay money every year, at a certain point of time they stop paying. That's what happens, you know. So um, if you if you can do it the other way around and give spectrum away with a long term license for for, for example, 25 years or, or longer, um, you have that for in the long term, you know, this effect. Um, second little example, USO funds. I mean, the issue of connectivity in, in these areas is not new. We have set up universal service obligations and universal service funds. The problem is that these are very bureaucratic um, instruments. Um, for example, very often they only provide services for, um, for fixed networks. I mean, so they're just for fixed networks and fi wire, wire line. Connectivity in these areas will be done by mobile. We know that. But, you know, the regulation is not updated, so they cannot pay. Even if they want to pay, they cannot pay to a, to a wireless uh, network <clears throat> like the one I just described to you. So just changing that would, you know, immediately open up funding um, easily um, from these funds. Um, another uh, issue. Um, Imagine for a second that you have then the, the main operators using one network in, these, in, in the rural countryside. You know? So they use an open wholesale network like IP uh, um, Inter What happens? Very often we still have as Telefonica or as another operator in the country coverage obligations in our licenses or by regulation. Um, so if the coverage of this rural operator is not counting against what we have to deploy in this country, uh, we're not interested. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, if, if you have still to cover then this area, despite the fact there is a connectivity, that makes no sense. But I mean, it makes no sense for us to then support a kind of wholesale open model. So these are all the things you have to consider and you have to basically take into account from a regulatory side, because otherwise the model is simply not, not very um, appealing. Um, there's one good example, and I always like to use it. Um, service and quality levels. Um, very often, for good reasons, regulators have included uh, obligations to operators that you know network has to be up and running after some some downtime, um, whatever in, in 24 hours or something like that. Um, that's good, fantastic. Um, that's easy to do if you are doing it in the, in the city center of Lima, where you have a lot of you know engineers around who can go and, and fix things. It's very hard to do if you'd have to do it in the Amazonia, where maybe the next uh, the next engineer of Telefonica might be hundreds of kilometers away. You have to fly in with a helicopter to find. I mean, it's really these are the challenges you have on the ground. Um, 
And so basically we have to provide um, due to this regulation, this kind of quality level, so it makes sometimes no sense. Um, uh, so what we've done with Interparatodos, um, and that's something where Peru has, has provided us possibilities, is that, for example, we can outsource maintenance to communities to a certain degree. Um, that means that there are people who are not employees of the company, um, but they have a, a knowledge about the network and they can set up things I mean, the usual thing is, you know, the antenna mass falls over because of the last thunderstorm. Um, and these are the real things happening, you know, and they can go and fix that. Um, and we don't have to do that with our own technicians. That brings down operational costs quite a lot. So these are all little things. Um, one of my favorites is also double taxation. Um, double taxation, why is that? Well, the moment you have, you know, the wholesale operator, you have the, the service provider getting connectivity from the wholesale operator and the client in the end buying it you have two, two times, you know, you have to buy connectivity. Every time the state puts on a tax. If you only have one vertical integrated, you don't have that. So what happens? That, you know, the wholesale model is disadvantaged towards an uh, integrated operator model. And, and these are little things, but if you're not having on the other side um, the interest and the conviction that you have to do that and you have to go down that route as well as the government and as a regulator to help, you will not get anywhere. So I think it needs to be a kind of joint private uh, public initiative and, and you have to kind of work towards a common goal. If you have that, there are things you can do to expand connectivity. Thank you very much. A catalog of um, different activities addressed to the policymakers. And before we open the floor, I would like to invite um, uh, Chine Cher to, to give an intervention on these, uh, the challenges and tools. Any, any suggestions on that, please? Um, thank you so much. I think from my perspective in terms of interventions and challenges is around um, ensuring enabling policy environments that are actually able to work in ensuring that we've got these operator models that allow for inclusive connectivity and um, also setting up um, monitoring and targets to actually ensure that you know we can actually evaluate operator licenses to ensure that they've actually done what they say they can and they say they would. And I think also that's as a way to ensure that um, the, co the rights of users at the end of the day that the service is being rolled out and paid for to provide. And I think there's also um, a need to support research to actually ensure that we've got evidence-based policy making in place. Because I think at the end of the day, if the research or if the operators are the only ones who have the data to be able to say where this is happening, then they can decide what goes out and what doesn't go out. Whereas if you support public institutions that are actually able to conduct the research and provide a neutral, I'll say neutral, point obviously that's trying to be pro-poor public interest, then you can actually be able to say, on a multi-stakeholder platform, governments, this is what we have funded and this is what has come out. Because at the end of the day, even if the model, that if the evidence is coming from the operator, there's a question of can everybody be able to access it and actually critique it and engage with it. So I think that is something that operators, a call to action actually to operators to fund public interest uh, research to ensure um, evidence-based policy. And I think issues around uptake have already been mentioned, so support around digital literacy, skills, and actually unpacking gender issues of in those connectivity areas, and power dynamics, because as much as we, the word power is, is being overlooked, we actually really have to understand the power dynamics at play when it comes to operator models. And then I think in terms of tools, my suggestion would actually be um, to bring the public more into this conversation, to support um, to, yeah, so monitoring of the targets that have been set and to ensure the targets are actually set. And to actually set up a way of monitoring the network quality and speed. Because when you think about meaningful connectivity, of course, a web foundation has started, has started looking at meaningful connectivity and actually doing a demand side survey in four countries to understand how people think about connectivity. One of the issues is around speed. And at the end of the day, even though most regulators would say that we have a platform where people can complain first to the operator, then to the regulator, you actually just realize that if there is some form of an interactive platform where people can actually log in to actually say there's a dip in the network, then perhaps we can have a conversation that moves beyond this is the target of having the threshold of quality, but to actually be able to monitor all of these and assess the levels of implementation. So I think in the challenges that we have, 
we've all been speaking about it, but now in terms of action, fund the research to understand where we can develop other business models and support alternative models, make this more inclusive, critique the power issues at place, and get the public involved to actually assess the quality of the networks that are currently in place. So those are my interventions. Thank you very much, Cheney, and uh, as you all heard, a bit three different perspectives, you can say. Uh, Rena has given you a, a number of policy, you can say public policy ideas, different activities uh, that could be done in order to, to address these issues. And then uh, Para Todos in Peru, example for how an operator, I think, is taking big steps to change or, or try, test uh, a new business approach. And then Chanae is just uh, asking, to some extent, my interpretation is, uh, is it's a different situation if there are networks in place compared if there is no networks. How do you get the networks in place? But uh, just underscoring involvement of the public side and also involvement. So with that, I would like to open, invite um, you to in, make an intervention. And so we have some from Colombia, has some community networks. Maybe you would like to make an intervention from, from your perspective in relation to what has been presented here. Please. Sure, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm not from Colombia. I'm, yeah. I'm from Spain. Please, I mean, uh, please in, introduce yourself. Uh, uh, my name is Carlos Rey Moreno. I work for the Association for Progressive Communications. And uh, actually, it's, it's not only community networks. I don't, I don't want it to be somehow siloed. I think it's about digital inclusion. And it's about how we were in a session right now with the director of the International Telecommunications Union Development Bureau, where the current models are plateauing, where new things need to be tried. And I think it's very bold. Uh, what Telefonica is doing and, and, and acknowledging some of the things that you acknowledge publicly. But I think there are other issues in the, in the, in the wholesale model beyond the ones that you, that you have mentioned no, around the, and I think you have gone through them with Mayutel and, and some of the issues around the bureaucracy. It's not only about universal access, it's about affordability. How much does it cost for that user in those, is, and, and there has been some issues around the pricing and the deal with, with Mayutel that is one of the, uh, rural operators that I, I don't want to, to get into, into them, right? But there are, there are some, some, um, some things that I wanted to bring up with, with the, the report that you mentioned as well in regards to the private sector and how sometimes we only think about the private sector as multinational or national big operators with foreign investment uh, building up this network and something that Berg mentioned at the beginning about the capital intensity of the infrastructure. I think that's no longer true. I think with the disaggregation of the, of the telecommunications infrastructure in the countries, with the, with the pervasivity of the, the fiber, with the low cost of several technologies, I think the, 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 the ecosystem is leading to, 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 a more, to allowing a more granular approach towards in the sector, to allowing small operators and community networks to provide, to provide access, not needing not, not, I'm not saying that there is not a role for Telefonica to play, and definitely all of us here use the networks of the, of the big operators, but I think in the places where those operators are not reaching for whatever reasons, uh, there is a space for smaller operators to play a role. There is a, there is a space for partnerships or not, for the, regula for the regulatory and policy environment to, to actually play a role to enabling, to enabling those, those spaces. Um, something, a couple of maybe a couple of points that I wanted to point out to something that Christoph uh, mentioned is, uh, you were talking about um, isla islands of demand, no? and how um, you were partnering with Facebook around identifying that. Well, we are advocating for something that is called open telecoms data, and it's been recently supported by the World Bank on how making, if all the operators, if the, the information that is with, with the regulators is made available, then it would be in the public to know how those targets are being met, how, where the islands of demands are, how small operators could actually get into a point of presence, understand where the point of presence are, understand where the a news spectrum is, understand, it would, it would allow definitely for a public di dialogue on how those universal service funds could be used or not used. I think, I think there, is, there, is, there is something that could be could be done there. And also around the, the, spectrum, the spectrum cost and fees that you were mentioning, I think there are interesting examples. In the case of South Africa, for instance, there is a pretty granular uh, 
uh, formula to calculate the spectrum fees that work at the national level as it works at the local level. It talks about spectrum sharing, it talks about uh, high demand spectrum and non high demand spectrum, about uh, urban areas, about rural areas, and taking all those parameters into consideration, you get to a price that the regulator is happy that the mobile network operators operating at a national scale, point to point to multi point or access pay. At the same time, it works at the local level for small operators to, to use a spectrum in point to point or in point to point to multi point. So maybe maybe that's something to look at. But overall I think my 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 contribution would be like we need to look beyond private I mean, the business models that were recognized, maybe they work in, 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 in Europe, but I think we need to nuance the, the role of uh, the private sector and also recognize that small and medium enterprises, collectively owned, like cooperatives, can also play a role on, on bridging the digital divide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other question at this stage before I have the panel comment? Please, introduce yourself and say. Hi there, my name is Thiago Camargo. I would like to ask to Christoph, I presume, that talked about uh, the Peruvian case, Internet para todos. Uh, you said that the regulator played a crucial role in uh, making possible to have uh, rural connectivity in Peru. What exactly the Peruvian regulator did that others regulators supposedly are not doing? Okay, I'll let uh, the panel, and Christoph, if you start, and then follow Verena. And come well, I think I'll go first to, to your uh, comments. Uh, I think you're very, very spot on. Um, I mean, community networks, um, I th we cooperate with community networks in Terpatolos as well. We do that. Um, and we're, I mean, obviously, community networks uh, can play a role in connectivity. There's no doubt about that. Um, the only thing we are, we are sometimes a little bit surprised is, um, it sounds sometimes like if it's a community network, you know, everyone has to support. If it's a big operator, you know, cash it as you can, you know? I mean, uh, if the conditions are there in rural areas to provide connectivity, you know, based on lower spectrum costs, based on other regulatory uh, support using USO funds, that's fantastic. But then that should be uh, accessible to all. I mean, we shouldn't kind of try just for, I mean, just because, you know, big, uh, big is uh, ugly and small is beautiful. Um, I mean, we shouldn't kind of try to make the market up as we, we would love it to have, um, but rather based on who can really then access these kind of uh, uh, possibilities and then let's see who can build and, and provide the best quality connectivity and, and that's a competition which is good for everyone in the end. So I think we are not, uh, we are cooperating with community networks, they have a great uh, advantage in, in what they are, which is very closely linked to the community, which is good. Um, so they can, for example, very often we see that they have very good uh, capacities of marketing in the community. They can also, as I said, maintain. So what I said to you about maintenance, very often is done by community networks um, and so on. But there are also very different type of community networks. There are quite big community networks. There are very, very small community networks. So they're all different type of, of forms. And, and you have to see um, what it is. The only thing I say clearly is fantastic. Uh, but sometimes this idea of let's help the little ones just because we like little ones, which is fantastic, um, I think it's not a good idea. In telecommunication equipment, uh, scale is a big cost factor. So if there is possibilities to build cheaper connectivity um, and innovative ones, fantastic. Um, but very often scale is an issue. And, and so basically uh, we've seen that uh, also bigger operators can create um, uh, very often lower network, uh, lower network deployment costs because of scale. Um, but as I said, I mean, that's, that's a competition and it's out there, uh, but please do the same rules for everyone. That's the only thing I think we ask for that. Um, regarding um, what the regulator in Peru did, I think I, I touched on a couple of things already. Uh, maybe I didn't cl uh, clarify sufficiently what the regulator in Peru did. I mean, one of the things uh, they did is, for example, that they uh, were flexible in using the USO funds. Um, so that was one of the things which was uh, clearly um, uh, done. Um, it was also available, for example, for demand side measures and so on. Um, there are issues around um, the different service levels as well, where the, where the regulator kind of created specific um, um, kind of uh, quality levels in that sense and service levels for, for the rural operator um, and also on spectrum policy. So, I mean, these were a couple of issues, but you can see that um, 
I mean, these are very little kind of uh, things they are doing. In the end, it combines to a picture of kind of recognizing that connectivity in the rural countryside is different also from a business model, sometimes from the, the more developed areas, and trying to create a model which can work uh, based on open access and wholesale. Um, so that's basically what they did in Peru and what others are, are kind of looking in in Latin America and are trying to, to learn from that experience. And Jay, just maybe um, to the first question. So basically in the reports, we, we broaden the scope. Um, so especially when we talk about the wholesale models. Um, so we talk about a lot of um, municipality networks. Um, so, and we have a couple of countries um, where we have that. Obviously like the country, I think the OECD countries where we have it most is Sweden. And there you have municipality networks like in big cities such as Stockholm, but you have like a lot actually in much uh, smaller cities. Um, another example is here in Germany because we're in Germany for the IGF. So you have actually um, municipality providers that provide public services. So typically like the traditional service like uh, water or energy. So some of them actually at the moment are building up um, fiber rings or fiber networks. So in there it's basically some sort of a public company, if you want so, that is providing the service. And we, we have some countries where it's basically um, a private company. We have some countries where it's a public company. Um, typically, it works best, you know, if it's done in an open access model. But we do mention that. So we, we do say, you know, there is a role for, for different types of players, etc. Yes, please, a question there. Uh, okay, um, I'm Santiago from Colombia. Um, I just uh, to make two comments. Uh, one of them is that um, we use the Spectrum auction um, to kind of obligate to operators to, to provide a service for at least 6,000 uh, spots in rural areas. So they gain the spectrum, and instead of paying more, they, they compromise to, uh, to connect those places. And I think it's a clever way. I, I didn't do it. That's why I, I can say it's clever. Uh, other agency did it. Um, so I think it was a clever way to do it. So they, ha they ha I mean, by the contract, they have to invest and connect uh, those uh, places. And also, we use the telecenter model. So we connect when, when there's at least 100 people living in a, in a very specific area. So we, we provide satellite uh, to connect. Of course, it's not with the same speed and the same capacity, but we, we combine the two of them. And the other comment that I want to say is, um, I want to make, is that it is important to build the demand of the broadband, not just the offer, the demand. Of course, uh, I understand uh, that that uh, internet can change the the history of a community or or the reality of a school, but sometimes this is more like a political a rhetorical than a, a than a reality. So if we really transform lives with the with the internet, uh, it's worth it, and then other agencies has to pay for the service. For for instance, if if I'm gonna provide uh, health like a t telemedicine, for instance. So the Ministry of, of Health could provide some money to, to pay for, for, for the cost because they, I mean, this, this ministry is saving money. But if, you are, if we are using the internet just for maybe WhatsApp, I, I, I'm not saying that it's not important. Of course, it, it is important for people to use WhatsApp and Facebook. Uh, but we call this the e-equation. So if we build more value of the internet, so other agencies can pay for the internet, not just the ministers, the ministries of ICT, but the ministries of health, or, or I don't know, the, the political agency, the, the one we deal with elections, for instance. Uh, so this is one, uh, even for education, we, we have improved that, that the internet is, is actually transforming the education. We provide computers uh, there, and we provide connectivity, but uh, the level of education is, is still the same. Nothing has really changed on those areas. So before connected, uh, to, uh, before to connect those areas, we should assure that the internet is going to make a difference. So it's not a matter of how, how much is it, because it's not a matter, uh, the matter of the ca to take the cable to, to connect the place, but the value of the services, and then the equation makes sense. 
Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any more questions before handing over? Yes, please. Uh, my name is Haris and I'm from Pakistan. I just want to make a comment, you know, we talk about the rural community, um, but um, in, this, in this whole discussion, I did not find um, uh, what we do in Pakistan and some other country as well is called Universal Service Fund or called as Universal Access Fund. Uh, what happens is that whenever the telecom operator goes into the country as per their license requirement, there's a very small contribution which they pay to that fund and then fund is utilized to go to those areas where it's not commercially viable for the operators to go. So the fund goes back to the operators uh, through a reverse auction model so all the operators can go and compete in that area and whoever asks for the less subsidy can provide the telecom infrastructure to that area. This has been a very successful model in Pakistan. It has covered more than 10 million uh, mobile broadband subscribers till now and uh, government of Pakistan, or, or in other words, the operator has committed over $600 million in the last six, uh, seven to eight years, and they do intend to commit another $800 million to provide high-speed mobile broadband to the marginalized community, which we are in the next four years looking at the population to cover approximately 25 million. So uh, this is a model which has been very successful in Pakistan. It's been also replicated by Africa and some other countries. So if somebody wants to go and look at the website and can get an idea or want to use this in their own countries for the rural community, I think it's a successful model which is uh, very acceptable by the operators, regulators, and the government in a, as a public-private partnership. And the website address is www. Uh, dot usf dot org dot pk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do you have any other examples from other countries or regions? Please. Um. Hello to everybody. My name is Juan Jung from ASIET. ASIET is the Latin America Telecom Operators Association. So I can talk a little bit about the experience of Latin America. And in the case of Latin America, the the story of the the story of the universal service funds is not a story of of success. In most cases, the funds have not been allocated. Uh, they we have to wait several years before before they have been allocated or they have not been allocated at all. There is some case even in which that money ended up covering general deficit, so outside of the sector. That is a serious problem. Uh, I was talking with a public authority of Latin America last week and he told me that they weren't able to allocate the funds because they were restricted to some specific technology, similar to what Christophe said earlier. Uh, so the experience of the universal service funds needs a rethink, I think. And we need to think out of the box. Out of the box uh, to find out how we can cover uh, those regions, those rural regions or isolated regions with connectivity. Internet para todos is an experience of thinking out of the box. It's the result of doing something different, something new. There are other possible solutions, but as in the case of the subsidized projects from the service funds or uh, the case of the community networks, we should be very careful with that initiatives because uh, we need to follow, of course, transparency, accountability, efficiency criteria, technological neutrality criteria. But one thing that is very important to be aware is that in any case, a subsidized project or a project that has uh, been given benefits can end up eventually competing with a non-subsidized or non-benefited project. If that happens, you are creating a serious distortion in the market with serious problems uh, with the economic incentives to invest. So uh, we must be very aware uh, about that. That's very important when we think about these out-of-the-box approaches. Thank you very much. Interesting to hear. Do you have, do you have, Mr. Please. 
Yes, um, I'm Ashraf from South Africa. Um, I've been involved in ICT policy uh, regulation for a number of years. Uh, some of the interesting um, dynamics uh, is uh, in our spectrum policy, we've opted for a wholesale uh, uh, access network, uh, which is open access, and it allows uh, different operators to, to make an impact and bid for auction in an, a non-discriminatory manner. Uh, the positives around that is uh, it allows smaller players to come to uh, the market. It sort of uh, tries to level the playing fields as the larger mobile operators have sort of dominated the sector for many years. Uh, but one of the huge debates that I don't see come through is essentially the uh, open OTT providers, over-the-top providers, uh, the large uh, content providers, uh, particularly net, Netflix and Facebook, who are huge beneficiaries of the system of digitization of networks, but they do not invest in any infrastructure or pay taxes or are licensed. Now, how do we create that power imbalance? Uh, what is the role of the regulator? What is the role of the policymaker? For instance, in Uganda, there's a huge debate on the social media tax. Purely as governments feel there is no revenue accruing to the revenue authorities. And as a result, they needed to intervene uh, in a very interesting way. As a result, uh, there is a policy vacuum, a regulatory vacuum, uh, is uh, over-the-top providers uh, making huge amounts of revenue, uh, and that is sucked out of the local, uh, the national. So there is some interesting uh, debates. Hopefully, the EU or ITU or OECD can conduct further research. Um, the, the big OTT giants vis-a-vis -vis the national operators and then the smaller players. I don't think there's enough uh, research and advocacy being done in, in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, before handing back to, to the panel and also giving the time, that do we have any uh, more suggestions, comments or uh, examples that you would like to give? Any hands, right? No? Thank you very much for, for the intervention. I, I would like them to hand over to the panel here to give a reflection on what had been said. Uh, really basically, and then after that, I will then sum up. Please, Verena. Uh, maybe just on the last question, um, and so this is actually not my department, um, so I'm in the Science Tech Innovation uh, Directorate of the OECD, but we have um, a whole um, taxation department um, that is looking into, into the issues of the digital economy, how, how to achieve, um, if you want, so a fairer balance. Um, so they also looked into the platforms. Um, so if you go to our website and you, you do um, OECD um, taxation, um, then you will find um, an overview of what we've been doing. And we recently launched a report on that issue. And I'm, I'm happy you know, um, to, to give you the link offline afterwards. Yeah, maybe just to follow up on that very quickly, I mean, uh, I think that's the right way going through uh, the OCD and maybe at a certain point of time the G20 to kind of uh, arrange a kind of modernization of tax policies. Clearly there's an imbalance and a symmetry and I think this needs to be tackled. I think that's, uh, that's widely recognized, um, not just in developing countries. Um, so I think that's, the OCD is doing great work on that. Hopefully it gets implemented at a certain point of time. Um, so I uh, just want to go back to the comment done uh, from our colleague from Colombia. Um, I think that uh, what you mentioned about the spectrum and you know, putting basically coverage obligation in the spectrum and auction with that, I think that's a good approach. It's a very straightforward and I think as you said, very smart approach. Um, I don't know how open I can be, but as I'm German, I will, I will speak about the country you're just in. Um, here in Germany, they don't, didn't do that. They just auctioned the spectrum, and then they basically are now using spectrum, the money they received, which was quite a lot for the spectrum auction, to set up a public fund, and now the public fund will then deploy again and help deploying infrastructure. So, I mean, these kind of solutions, um, in the end, I think create just, you know, delays uh, in, in the investment. I think that... Um, if you take one thing away from here, I hope that it is that this is kind of everyday work and it's difficult work and it's, it's in the end going back to really um, can I deploy connectivity here or not, how can I update it, what's the technology I use, how to, with whom do I have to cooperate and so on. I mean this is everyday work, it's not easy to do these things. So the moment you kind of bring in 
too many people in the middle, I think it's, it's not helping with the deployment. So I think the, the, the idea to include it in, in spectrum licenses is great. France has done that for 5G, Japan has done it for 5G, um, and I think they will get good results. And it's, I mean, let them, the, the operators do it. I mean, that's our everyday business and let's go forward. Um, and I think that's, that's a great approach. Um, so what I just want to say is around the demand side, and that's also very important. We haven't talked about that. Um, but of course the demand is important. One of the things I hope, and I'm very honest here, is that um, we also understand, of course there is you know, contents and there's culture and there's language problems and all of that. Education, maybe the biggest one. I don't want to, uh, to do more marketing here, but I mean Telefonica is doing a lot of things around education to kind of teach the teachers, which is the first step, you know, because otherwise you put, you know, uh, networks and connectivity to the schools and no one is using it really in a good way. Um, so, but I think more important even is that to get out of the kind of uh, box here again and say, hey, we are producers. I mean, that's a digital revolution going on. We are producers who can do things. And I think there's a lot of creative energy in many um, emerging economies in developing countries, but I haven't seen, you know, uh, sufficiently that people take the opportunities digitalization gives you and create business and create possibilities to go forward. I mean, we cannot just be consumers of, you know, some stuff uh, generated by someone. We should have, you know, the idea of using that to, to improve communities and to improve um, the societies where we are. I think there's a lot of unserved demand on that side and I can tell you that this is one of my greatest concerns I would say how can we create this kind of more innovative spirit um, also in, in emerging economies and developing countries um, I think that people there are as clever as they are in other parts and and you know I don't see sufficiently that happening and that would be one of the things which would kind of drive demand um, and help with the demand side issue as well so that's my um, my final point on that thank you thank you thank you very much Chennai please um, thank you very much. I think my, con my comments around uh, the gentleman from South Africa who spoke about the OTT um, taxation models, there has been extensive research done by Research ICT Africa and Research ICT Solutions that have looked at um, the need for operators to either innovate or die. And I, I have worked, I think Cameroon was one of the first countries where I worked on where they actually then um, created new models of pricing packages to ensure that they could capture the data revenue market. The only challenging they were, challenge there was that in terms of the license around who has the ability to deliver a 2G, um, an, a, 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 an evolved network. So the work that was done by Research ICD Africa allowed for the government to actually take away the license from VTL and give operators another opportunity to expand beyond what was there. So I do think there is research and um, perhaps there is now more of a question of opening it up. And the taxation issues now are more kind of like, when you think about Uganda, that was a syntax that was more kind of like people are gossiping on the network. Therefore, how do we make sure that they don't do that? And then it comes back to the issue of taxing a platform that where most people are actually using it as a cheap alternative to communicate. And then it does sort of seem to protect the traditional um, operators on the market. So the work that has been done by Dr. Chris Stock with the Research ICT Solutions, and quite recently a policy paper that they've worked on has mapped out how operators can now evolve more into the data market and actually see how they can capture the value chain beyond simply seeking regulation that protects them without evolving. So I guess that's where my underlying around the whole debate around revenue comes from. And then I think with the issues around demand side, perhaps that was what I was trying to say when I said funding for research, because I do believe there is a demand for, uh, I mean like, in my work and understanding uh, developing markets, what we've seen is that the way that we sit here and define uh, a consumer versus a producer is completely different from when you actually get on the ground where people are limited with solutions. They probably are spending as much, as little as they have on data in able to communicate and get access to information that is very difficult. So there comes the affordability issue and innovating with digital literacy. If you look at educational curriculums that are currently existent, not capacitating people to the right level of being innovative on the platform. Therefore, if we were to support, and once again, a call to action to operators and those with the funds to actually invest in research to understand trends of internet access and use and meaningful use, how is it that in these economies, I'll give you a case of example of Zimbabwe, where um, I was speaking to a colleague from Mozilla, how they went into a country where, I mean, the level, 
it's one of the most expensive countries to access the internet. But every solution that is being pioneered by, um, op by smaller players, by innovators, has been designed to address solutions within the country. So I do think that there is more need for investment to actually understand that in these contexts where beyond the, te the telecoms environment, where people are facing political and economic environments that are actually shutting them down from being able to do more, how is it they're circumventing that and engaging? And it does also allow us to question what we mean by consumer and producer, and what does it mean for someone to be a productive user of the internet beyond what our definitions are when we look at policy solutions and what's in existent. So I guess my closing point is a call to action to actually fund and invest to understand what is it that is being done with what is currently being in there in those hard political environments that we are saying that may be difficult to invest in or we're saying that we need to push up uptake for demand of these services. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chennai. Thank you, Christophe, and thank you, Verena. And the, the mission with this, or the objective with this workshop was to discuss the concrete and innovative ways to connect people and business, businesses for expanding digital inclusion. And what we have done here is uh, we have discussed and uh, heard about an example from, from Peru, and you have all uh, contributed with various examples from, from, from different continents. And, and clearly we can say that uh, a private company forming a new consortia and stepping out of the comfort zone, thinking out of the box, and also asking for regulators to step out of the regulatory uh, comfortable zone in order to, to make it possible to change the market. And we heard Chenei here, he, she, I mean, she, she's a point here and giving some more evidence base for how this could be done. Uh, f research in order to, to, to bridge this uh, digital divide. And Verena has uh, provided us with a number of, of concrete uh, steps that could facilitate uh, uh, expanded deployment of networks to, to the unconnected. This question is not simple. It is a question that policymakers are struggling with around the world, I would say. And, uh, and uh, if there is no demand, there is no market. And I think, uh, in my thinking at least, that I mean, if you're young today, living in Zimbabwe, South Africa, Sweden, or any country, that you want to be connected, and uh, then we can have different views, value this in different ways, that it's clearly shaping our society. So I would like to thank you coming here to the workshop, thanking the panel to addressing this question. I would say this question has to be continued. Discussion will continue. So with that, I would like to please thank you all with a big hand. Thank you.